purpose of the relationship between a rabbi and a student, a rabbi and a congregation, is in order to grow strong together and help each other get closer to a Kadosh Baruch Hu. This week's Torah portion is Parashat Vayakel, and we're also reading Parashat Pikudei. Question was asked, why do we sometimes have two parashiot and why sometimes do we not? Most of the time we don't. So if anyone will open up the Torah and count how many Torah portions there are, there's actually 54 Torah portions. How many, day, how many weeks are there in a year? There's 52. So we're already two, we have two more than how many weeks we have. Another thing is that on the holidays, and specifically Pesach and, and Sukkot, that Shabbat we don't read a Torah portion. We actually read a special Torah portion regarding to Shabbat Sukkot and Shabbat Pesach. So that leads us another two down. So out of the 52 weeks, only 50 weeks per se have a Torah portion. And that would leave us with four weeks, at least four weeks that would need to be doubled up. Whenever we have two Adars, two of the month of Adar, so we don't have this problem. We either don't make, we don't do any double parashas, or we only have one a year. This year we don't have two Adars. So that's why we'll have a sequence of a couple double Torah portions at the end of this uh, book, at the end of Leviticus as well, and as we'll have uh, the, the couple times. So that's how come we do have two Torah portions. Was it always this way? Well, the Talmud tells us that it used to be that the Torah was finished every two or three years unlike the way we do it nowadays. The way we do it nowadays is that we always try to finish it by Sukkot, before Sukkot, and then after Sukkot, by Simchat Torah, we start Bereshit every year. That is a custom that has been going on for way longer than we could ever remember, but it wasn't always that way. It was not, it was not a set thing that every year they finished. It was every two, two and a half, three years that every community uh, finished it. Personally, it does make there's advantages and disadvantages to finishing the Torah so quickly. Um, finishing it quickly means we have some type of regiment that every year we know we go through the whole Torah and uh, anywhere we go in the world, we have that parasha that could be found. The, po the plus of not finishing the Torah every year, rather every two or three years, would be that, again, we have time for more in-depth study since we're going a little bit, uh, a little bit slower. But Baruch Hashem, that's what we do here. In our, in our synagogue, we take our time and we focus on very key concepts of the Torah portion, whether it be during the week like we do here on Wednesday nights, or as we do on Shabbat and multiple other times during the week to analyze the Torah. So there's positives, there's pros and cons to both of those ways. That's the world we live in now, that is the tradition. So every week we have at least one parasha and rarely we have two parashot as this week. Now, <clears throat> The last five Torah portions of the second book of the Torah, the book of Exodus, speak specifically about the Mishkan, this portable tabernacle that God commanded the Jewish people to build after Mount Sinai and will be with them as their, as their home of God during their travels in the wilderness in the desert. So starting from the last five parashot, parashat Terumah, speaks about the Mishkan, its fundraising, and its building directions. Not the actual building, but the building directions. The next Torah portion of Tetzaveh speaks about the garments that Aaron was to wear during his service. So that's the Kohanim's garments and their vestments. Kitisa speaks about the collecting of the half shekel, which would fund uh, different parts of the of the Mishkan and the daily sacrifices, as well as the unfortunate, as we read in last week's Torah portion, the unfortunate sin of the golden calf. Vayakel, which is this week's first Torah portion, speaks again about fundraising and then the actual construction of the Mishkan. And the last Torah portion in the book of Exodus, in the book of Shemot, is Pikudeh, which is a summary of the whole portion of the building and the finishing off and the setting up of the Mishkan. Those are the last five Torah portions. Now in the beginning of this week's Torah portion, Parashat Vayakel, God tells Moses to stop. 
and tell the Jewish people the following. Sheshet yamim te'aseh melacha. Six days you will work. Ubayom ashivi ye lachem kodesh. And on the seventh day, the day of Shabbat, it will be a holy day. Shabbat Shabbaton Ladonai, it is a day of rest that God has given you. Kol haoseh bo melacha yumat, and anybody who does do melacha, do prohibited work on Shabbat, is liable for capital punishment. The commentaries ask, and they jump on right away, and they say, we have a sequence. As we just went through, these five last parashot have a sequence of the planning of the building of the Mishkan, and the, the garments for the Kohen, the raising of the funds. Now we're actually going to get to building it, and then summarizing it. Why in the middle of this sequence do we have, again, the Torah coming and pausing and telling us, do not break Shabbat. Work six days and rest on the day of Shabbat. If we pay attention, not long ago, we received the Ten Commandments. None other than the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments was keeping Shabbat, remembering Shabbat, guarding Shabbat. So why is there a need to re- tell and recommand the Jewish people is the question of the Talmud as well as the commentaries and they answer as follows God was teaching the Jewish people a very important lesson and telling them that even though it is one of the most noble deeds to build the very house that God himself will take place where he will be where he will rest where he will be part of us here in in this world as important as it is Building on Shabbat is not allowed. Six days a week, you will work. Six days a week, you will build this Mishkan. You will build this tabernacle. On the seventh day, you shall not. The Zer Shimshon, now this is famous. Everyone knows what we just said. The Zer Shimshon now asks a beautiful question. Something that personally I've never thought of. He says, I'd understand why someone would want to work or build on the seventh day. The answer to that would be if they're in a rush. Someone who is in a rush works double time, works weekends, works nights. So it would make sense. You're working six days and you're going to work the seventh also. He takes an observation and he says, the Jewish people didn't seem like they were in such a rush. It took them almost three months to put together the Mishkan and then almost another three months to till they actually put it together on the 25th of Kislev they finished the building of the Mishkan and then they took an almost three month pause until they put it together what does that mean that God is telling them God is telling Moses don't work on Shabbat they're not in a rush they have their sweet time why would they even think to work on Shabbat that's the Zeshim Shon's question. They were in no rush, so why tell them don't work on Shabbat? Answers the Zeshim Shon, he says, that's obvious that they were not going to work on Shabbat, as you've proven to us that they were not in any rush. So you know why God had to reiterate? And this is a beautiful lesson that comes out of this. God had to reiterate that, yes, during the construction of the Beit HaMikdash, to be, and also the Mishkan right now, you would not be able to do so on Shabbat. But what happens after the temple or after the tabernacle was up and running and everything was moving smoothly? Did you know that actually on Shabbat and the holidays, when it would be prohibited to do melacha, any prohibited actions outside of the temple, outside of the tabernacle, in the tabernacle itself there were certain melachot, as we say, which would be prohibited actions that would be prohibited on Shabbat, were not only permissible, they were obligatory to be done in the temple, such as slaughtering the animals, such as moving fire, such as different things that, that would not be permitted to be done outside of the temple or the tabernacle. But on Shabbat, in the tabernacle, it was not only allowed, it was obligated. So you might come think and say, since anyways I'm allowed to break Shabbat because I have to, because that's part of the service God wants from me. You might think that if something breaks in the temple or in the tabernacle, 
Let's say one of the walls need some, some attention, or the altar, or any other type of the vessels need some attention in the Mishkan, or the Beit HaMikdash itself, that on Shabbat we'd be permitted to do so? No. On Shabbat, you cannot do that. On Shabbat, you cannot do something which you could have taken care of before. Making sure that the walls are up, making sure that all the vessels are ready to be used, and all of that is something which you should have and could have prepared from before. Slaughtering the animal and all the other parts of service had to be done on that day itself. That's what's allowed and has to be done on Shabbat, but not anything that should have and could have been done from before. To this, the Talmud tells us, and I'll quote it to you in Hebrew, it says, Kol HaMivashel, the Talmud tells us as follows, Kol HaMivashel Me'erev Shabbat, whoever cooks on Friday, Yochal Shabbat. He'll eat on Shabbat, she'll eat on Shabbat. But if you didn't cook on, on, on Erev Shabbat, you won't have anything to eat on Shabbat. Obviously, if you keep Shabbat, as we're supposed to. So the Talmud is telling us something very simple. If you prepare, you will be ready. If you plan, you will have plans. Now, it doesn't mean you need to cook per se. You can make arrangements. You can have yourself invited. You can travel. You can do many things. But if you don't have your plans before Shabbat, what's going to be on Shabbat? You're not going to be left with doing anything on Shabbat. And that's only an anecdote to the comparison between this world and the next. This world is like before Shabbat. It's where we have the opportunity to prepare for the next world, for Olam Ha'emet, the world of truth. After a person passes away, we can't continue preparing. Whatever we've prepared for in this world is what we will reap benefits from and consequences and results being for the good and even for the opposite in the next world. So not only is the week very important to prepare for Shabbat, our life is very important. It is our opportunity to prepare for afterlife. Because once we get there, it's unfortunately too late. Just as when the onset of Shabbat comes, it's too late now to prepare for Shabbat. Shabbat has come, so too we need to prepare. In the Mishkan, all the preparations, the necessary preparations to make sure the walls and the vessels and the altar and everything was prepared had to be done from before Shabbat. The service itself, only that was allowed. And that's why at this point does God tell Moses, reiterate and recommend to the Jewish people that the keeping of Shabbat is so important that even the building of the Mishkan, not only the building, but even the upkeep and the maintenance of the Mishkan is not allowed to be done on 